Aaron's Gibbet, you want to go ahead and hit record? Oh, you did already. Awesome. All right. Well, welcome to the Active Teaching Lab. My name is John Martin, and uh, I will be your uh, host and facilitator today. And let me just get up the activity sheet here. In the chat window, you will see that there is an activity sheet that's been shared out. And I will quick put that on the screen here. Um, if you've not been to an active teaching lab in the in the past, one of the things that we do here is we try to offer multiple means. If you're familiar with universal design for learning, you remember multiple means of engagement and of representation and of um, expression. So, ooh, Julie Collins, all right, I interrupt this intro to uh, point people to the chat. Way to go, Julie. Um, she got the, the link to join at 2.30, and I want to take that and put that in another window here, just so I don't lose that after the chat ends today. All right. Well done. You get a gold star today, Julie. All right, back to what I was talking about. The <laughs> first 60 seconds in Canvas. If you've opened up Canvas, and if you think back a couple of years uh, ago, um, on campus here we had Moodle, and we had Desire to Learn, and um, and then uh, and some people used WordPress. Uh, there is an instructor who used the knowledge base documents um, there. Some people built websites uh, for their course, right? And there were lots of different ways that people would share course information um, to their students. And then to simplify that because students would say, you know, they have to learn one thing for one class and another thing for another class, and then go to Moodle for the third class. Um, Canvas said, okay, students are complaining a lot, and we are supporting all of these different systems at great expense. Can we simplify? Um, can we just have one? And so we moved over to Canvas. Um, the nice thing about Canvas is it's now consistent across campus, right? Students who come to your Canvas page know where to go for the most part because it looks and feels the same as what they learned in their other courses. Now, there's some customization that you can do, of course, but for the most part, it has a, a same look and feel, and the students know what it looks like, and they know where um, the assignments are, and they know where the discussion is, and they know how that discussion thread goes after they do it for a little while. So it's easier for them. What this means is they don't have to spend so much time saying, how am I going to figure out how to do this for the course? They can spend that time on what is the content of the course rather than the structure of the course. So that's good, right? But it can be better if we employ some design tricks in Canvas so that immediately when the students log on to your web page or onto your Canvas site for the very first time, they can see exactly what they need to do, exactly where they need to go, exactly why they're there. Um, and we have a home page, right? And sometimes the home page is a list of modules. So they get kind of a checklist of like, well, I'll start at the top and I will work my way down on this. Or they might have a home page where um, you say, hi, my name is Professor so-and-so, and you got a little picture there, and that looks very human, right? So it's not just this sort of cold, sterile environment um, of course content and personality. Um, if you remember, when you were in college, you had favorite instructors, and you had, um, you had to figure out what does instructor A want versus what does instructor B want? Your students are still doing that, except now oftentimes in this remote environment. We need, they need, so it's harder for them to figure that out, right? Because they can't see your nonverbals as much. They can't see you pace across the floor. Uh, they don't have a better sense of your, um, your demeanor in some ways, other than what is shared through that um, Canvas page, at least at first glance. It develops over the semester, of course. But it's important for students to figure that out right away so they can say, all right, now that I've got that part figured out, 
I can now focus on the content. Um, but it's, it's hard to focus on the content if you don't know what the expectations of the instructor are. So use your Canvas page and your Canvas homepage to make it about yourself and your own humanity, course design, um, expectations, right? Um, and the objectives of, of, of learning, but also to help them, the students, um, connect to each other. As we were talking about right before the uh, the session started, uh, we were talking about active learning and in vet, vet uh, specifically. But things are changing right now. Where, I'm sorry, the, the nature of education and the nature of higher education is changing with active learning. With active learning, we are letting students take on more of a teaching role. They can teach each other. They can uh, communicate with each other. They can engage with each other. And if you think about engagement, engagement is really easy to do one-on-one, -on -one, right? If you sit down with anybody and you have a conversation, uh, we can communicate with each other. We can figure things out. Um, you've got push, yeah, I can give pushback to you. You can give pushback to my ideas. Um, if we have three people, we get a third opinion in there. If we have five people, okay, starting to get a little bit unwieldy. But if you think about what you can do as an instructor with 50, can't you cannot give them pushback on on all of on all of their points you can't it's just impossible to give them a chance to name them maria thank you for joining today and um uh, we do have a ux designer um here let me just do a quick i'm going to make her a moderator we need to build that into this sort of weird user interface of camps right so the struggle is how do we how do we build these things in to our course? How do we make a, a space where students can engage with each other as well as a roadmap of what the course looks like? Um, get the sort of turn by turn directions from activity to activity and um, do all stuff within this sort of framework of Canvas. So that's today's topic um, in a nutshell. On our activity sheet here, you will see that there are, uh, I've got some takeaways here at the very top for you to look at um, and maybe use those um, and add some questions or issues you'd like us to address today. Now I say you want us to address and by us I mean you as well. Um, I've got some good educational experience. Um, I have a PhD in education, right? So I've got some research um, to back up the things that I say. I have never taught a wet lab course, so I've got zero experience in that area. I need to rely on participants who have done that. I've never taught a 500 person class. Zero experience again. I can tell you stories that I've heard, but I need all of you to participate. Um, and so on the left hand column, if you have ideas on how to answer the questions on the right or on the left, people writing on the left, um, please do that answer the questions on the left-hand side, share your ideas. Anything that I say today is not the word of truth. It is a word of truth. Um, and I recognize the same for you. Things that work really well in the situations that I've seen might not work in your situation. Um, contexts matter, right? Contexts are different. And um, so we need a lot of ideas, and then we need you to engage and think about which one of these ideas will work the best for me. So, excellent. Farther down on the uh, activity sheet, activity sheet's really a misnomer. We used to structure the active teaching labs where we would actually have you go through some things. Um, multiple means of representation and engagement. We have things, if you have all, if you've never worked on this before, I encourage you to start with the simple stuff. Start with the easy stuff. If you've gotten in there a little bit, or you're getting familiar with it enough uh, that the easy stuff is boring, start looking at the medium stuff. Oftentimes we'll have some challenges in here. Um, for this Canvas stuff, I am encouraging people to, it's simple. So I have, I try to avoid the challenges, both for yourself. Um, if you're gonna build a course and then you leave, somebody's gotta fix that course afterwards or rebuild it. So don't make it too complicated. Keep it simple. Keep it simple for the students. Keep it simple for um, yourself uh, to fix and maintain and for anyone who comes after you. So avoid the challenge stuff. 
Easy and medium is good. So lots of stuff to, to look through here. Um, that's uh, different forms of representation, easy, medium. I've got a lot of links here. I've got a lot of um, some graphics and such. But we are mostly a responsive session. So whatever ideas that you have, uh, we can talk about it. And in addition to the chat window here, and in addition to this table that I've got for ideas and challenges, I invite you to unmute your microphone and or raise your hand and let me know if you have something that is harder to uh, express than writing in, in text here. Uh, so use your microphone as well. Uh, let me just give you a second while I take a drink um, to do that. All right, hearing nothing but seeing activity in the um, activity sheet I like that. We can just go ahead and get started on this, and I encourage you to um, continue to add lines or grab lines that are unused and add more questions that come up. Um, we have whole conversations that happen here on this activity sheet, and this is one of the things that I really love about, about the activity sheet, because there are things that I've never heard of. Uh, before that come into this. So the first things that I want to um, point out is uh, and, and address is this, how, do, how can I use easy HTML hacks to help my course design? So this is actually a question that none of you put together, put in, but it was put in by a uh, prior participant. And I wanted to address it. Two things to address this one. Keep it simple. So avoid all of the HTML hacks. And I, I add a, a star of disclaimer there, right? Avoid unnecessary ones. There are cool things that you can do, but important to do. If you remember when web pages were first created and the internet first came online, um, how many of you remember the animated GIF? Right? You log on to MySpace or Friendster or um, even regular web pages, and you'd see all of these little sparkly things and text that would flash, and uh, sometimes they had music come on. And the page is personal. They are kind of overwhelmingly complicated and hard to read, and it was um, sometimes really, really terrible design. You rarely see those anymore. And you rarely see those because keeping it simple is better user design. We no longer are starved for information. We now are flooded with information, drowning in information. And so the simpler you keep things, the better it is for, this, for your students um, for, to be able to parse through it, to be able to figure that out. So we've got some information on ways to customize pages, but be careful when you use them because they can be overwhelming um, and complicated and they can break. Um, that said, this web, uh, asked, webinar asked, talks about things like um, the slides. They're a simple um, tool that most of your students, because they've come from K-12, which uses Google Documents quite a bit and Google Tools quite a bit, they're already very familiar with this. And because they're familiar with it, it's easy. It's an easy tool for you to and use, and they will already. Um, so Google Slides, um, using table head, using dividing lines, these are simple enough things that they're not, um, they won't act, they won't come. All right, I am cutting in and out. This is weird because my microphone says that I'm fine. This is a terrible thing. All right, let me switch up my microphone here. And I will encourage someone else to uh, 
jump in and share an idea while I do that. Well, this is Kieran Skeba where we're waiting for John. I did put, put in some of the templates that are available for people to use because someone asked how can you um, make your courses look a little more consistent. So I provided in the Google Docs some, some templates. There's a lot of different ones out there that you may want to check with your school and college with. Some are recommended to be used by a student school or college, but they have common things like orientation, you know, and they have some interesting ways to set up the pages too. So that's that's one idea. Yeah, and this is really a, a, a fantastic resource. Um, if you think about what it takes to design a website that's easy to use, we've got campus instruction designers, and they have thought through what's accessible, what's effective, um, and they've created pages and pages that you can use at both um, a, a knowledge-based document um, of Canvas course templates, but then they have uh, Letters and Sciences has uh, templates they put together specifically for remote teaching. So take a look at those, get some ideas from them, or just use them um, straight up. One warning with using templates, before you import them into your course, um, sandbox course, and import them into a sandbox course. This is important because if you import a template into your existing course, it will add to your course and it can complicate things and you've got to go through and then sort out, is this page good uh, part of my old course or is it part of the new course? And you've got to figure that all out. So grab a sandbox course and maybe somebody can um, grab a link to how to get in boxes. I forgot to add that in the active teaching lab uh, activity sheet. How's my voice? Is this a little bit better? I'm using a different mic right now. Yes, okay. So my little jobber headphones are not the trick today. Um, Bluetooth is suffering. It's not my internet, so that's good to know. Thank you all. And yes, thank you for um, adding out the template. Next topic, what are some of the pros and cons of using modules versus linked pages to organize course content? All right, and that's a whole other question, how to use the mark as down feature. So one very simple way to start, other than using templates, is to use modules, right, as your home page. And if you've got good course design or good organizational design, um, and really good naming conventions that are consistent throughout, um, it's not a terrible way to get it up and running. Um, when I ask people how to, or when I encourage people to design their courses, I often say, start by using templates. I'm sorry, start by using the modules and get your sort of, uh, this comes first and in this unit we'll have these different parts. It's kind of like creating an outline using the modules, right? You can indent and you can add unit code um, icons, so you can add a limited amount of symbols. I've got information on that down at the bottom here. Again, use caution when you do this. Some of them don't make any sense. Um, so if you are going to use these icons, make sure that like a home for home page, that's kind of a universal thing. Um, Canvas you might remember has a rocket ship for quiz. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. That's the use of an icon that just doesn't make sense to have assessment be the spaceship. So use those carefully. Uh, make sure that they're universal, not just in your class, but across the internet language. So you can use modules, but modules don't let you add a lot of context around um, the content that you're going to be sharing. And what I mean by that is it's important to know what to do, but it's also important to know why should I do this? How does what I, you want me to do connect with what we learned last week? How does it connect with what our objectives are for the whole course? 
that information needs to be communicated over and over and over again to remind the students for the activity, after the activity, so that they can reflect on it, before the activity, so they can go along in the activity and be like, oh yes, I need to, I need to get this out of this activity. Uh, this is why I'm doing the activity. That's my motivation for getting in. It's important because of these learning objectives. And after the activity, what did I learn? Did I learn, oh yeah, these are the things that I was supposed to do. Did I do that? Yeah, I guess I did. Or, and here's how they connect with my personal um, path or the reason that I'm taking the class, my vision for taking the class, my vision of success, that personalization of learning. Uh, modules don't let you, they don't give you enough space for that stuff. So some people like to use pages. And on that, on those pages, they can put links to modules, right? They can put links to pages and quizzes and readings and videos and whatever within that page. And in that page, you can add a paragraph of, this is why I want you to do it. These are the things I need you to get out of this. And even have some questions. Why do you think that this is important? So that's a really good way to uh, reuse pages. Um, one other consideration for organizing course content, especially if you want the students to come to class prepared, put part content that you would put in a page in a quiz. You can have a paragraph and read that paragraph as the text question, right? And then ask them a quick little knowledge check. Did you get this out of that? You can embed documents in that um, rich text editor in the question. You can embed videos in there. You can embed a section of a video, right? The use start and stop feature um, when you embed videos where it says, this YouTube video, but start at you know 35 seconds and end at a minute 26. Use that code. Put it in that um, quiz question, and then for that section, whatever the points are of that, give them a little knowledge check after that. All right. And then the mark is done. Great. Somebody added that here. This is great. And what that mark is done means um, for folks who might not be familiar with it. Um, as soon as your student gets done at the bottom of the page, there's that little next button. But there's also um, in the modules a little, it's a little dot I think that comes up, right? That says you did this. And that way, when the students come back to that module page and they're like, "Crap, how far did I get here before I got that phone call?" Um, oh yeah, dot dot dot. I'm on this part right. Now. So it's kind of a quick way of doing that. No, Molly, the mark is done at the bottom of uh, the Canvas thing. And the good news about that is that it's the same for everybody. So the students don't have to go, where on the page is it for this instructor versus that instructor? Um, it's always at the, at the top of the page. But uh, yeah, there are some user design choices that Canvas is still working on. All right. Any other thoughts and questions? I'm going to give you a, a, a 30 seconds here. I'll catch up on chat, okay? All right. One of the things that, uh, that Angela put in chat that I like this idea as well, a combo of pages and modules. In modules, every time that I use modules, I, I always encourage um, other people and, and do this myself top page is an overview that explains what else is happening in the modules. And oftentimes in that top page, that overview page that, that Angela talked about, that's where I might have links to the other pieces in that module. So they could go and click through the module if they want to, or they can just go through that page um, on their own. Um, it's a little bit more work for me to sort of organize that, um, but it also lets me provide that context um, when I present that information for them. All right. Yes, the mark is done. All right. OK, here's a good question I don't know the answer to. What maximum number of words that should be on the home page? Um, I'm going to uh, 
um, alert Maria to um, if she has internet research on how much information should be on a page uh, to jump in if she'd like to. Um, and in the meantime, I'm just going to come in and say, well, it depends, because um, that's always a safe answer. Right. Um, hi, John. Yes, I will pipe in about this. Um, and it, you're, I think you're right, that it does depend. So um, in the activity sheet um, below what you had posted about the HTML hacks, I plopped in there something that are called um, usability heuristics. Um, so these are general heuristics. Now, there are lots of different permutations and formulations. These are 10 that we tend to use because they're well recognized. But um, essentially, they're all sort of describing what makes a good interface. And one of those 10 heuristics is minimal and aesthetic design, uh, which means that essentially everything on the page is warring with everything else for attention. Now, you have also this um, idea, this uh, heuristic of you want to have your users recognize something rather than have to recall it. So they don't want to have to remember how to get to a certain thing. They should be able to recognize. So you have this tension of you know, how much do I put on the page so that the students can recognize rather than having to remember how to get somewhere. And then keeping in mind that everything on the page is warring with everything else for attention. So if I if I can just jump in, especially for the recognition rather than recall, in many ways, um, I used in the activity at the very top of the activity sheet, uh, uh, the metaphor of Google Maps, right? Or your navigation, your GPS in your car. Um, it's important to have sort of that overview, right, of this trip's going to take six hours and it's going to, you know, there's the line of where we're going to, we're going to, go through Chicago or whatever to get there, right? That overview is really important so that we understand um, sort of what's going to be happening. But there's also this uh, idea of turn-by-turn -turn, um, navigation, right? So at that overview page, you cannot have a like, oh, and remember that in three hours and 14 minutes, approximately, you're going to get to exit 32 whatever B, and you're going to have to take a right there and then take a left after that. You can't remember that at the beginning. That's no good. So that turn by turn information is also important. But at that point, you might be able to recognize that, oh yeah, I remember that's when we veered off into Indianapolis or whatever. That's where the recognition rather than uh, the, the recall I think comes in because we didn't have to remember from the beginning of the course what we're doing in week six, right? We have a general idea of that path or that journey that we're gonna take, but that specific information um, needs to be very detailed at a certain spot, but not earlier. And so in some ways, when you talk about everything is worrying with everything else, if you have too much information, um, that's going to get lost. If you have the details and the overview sort of put together, then you don't have a map. You need the details when you need the details, just in time learning, rather than ahead. Someday you're going to need to know to turn off to X38B. All right, good resource. Thank you very much. We'll get back to the activity sheet. All right. And Anya, I think, yes, there is the link to the uh, general interface guidelines, the heuristics that we just shared that I've highlighted right now. All right. Very good. All right. And somebody added. Just skip away. I skipped around too much, didn't I? All right. Adding images to the Canvas pages. <laughs> Seems impossible. Yes, uh, Canvas does image integration terribly. And if you think it's bad for you as an instructor, it's even worse for the students. Um, try logging in as a student and um, adding an image to a discussion forum, for example. It's a nightmare, especially, it's not a nightmare, it's actually a miracle that we can do this, right? 
It's kind of like flying an airplane. It's a miracle that we can fly an airplane across the country or whatever. But it's far more complicated now that we know this, um, how easy it is to add images other places. To be able to add them in, in Canvas is, is, is very difficult, both for you as an instructor and, again, even worse as a, as a student. Uh, this is actually one of the reasons that I prefer Google Docs, because I want to do a quick screenshot of a section of a, a page, and I want to put this in. I can just copy it and paste it in, and boom, there's my screenshot. I can resize it. Like, imagine how beautiful this would be if Canvas lets us do that, right? But alas, Canvas does not let us do that. Um, so that's why people love tools um, like Padlet or the, what's the other one? PictoChart here, right? Um, Padlet and PictoChart, again, these are not campus-supported tools. Um, and therefore, we officially discourage you from using them. However, you can ask your students um, for their solutions. Um, don't force them to join uh, an account or set up an account or something. A lot of tools out there are not privacy protected. They're not by our lawyers, etc. cetera. Um, so be very careful when using external third-party tools. However, your students are, should feel free to use the tools that they are comfortable with, provided they can input that end result into um, into a campus supported tool. But yeah, how to do it? There you go. Upload images, upload new image, um, and it's complicated. And the file storage system in Canvas, if you've played around with it, it's also really terrible. So hope for better updates in the future. Yeah. Sorry. The simplest answer is don't use them. Right? But that's not a very satisfying answer. Um, Maybe even things like using embedding Google Docs in there where it is easy, or Google Slides. All right, tips for using Instructure UI or something like it. I don't know what Instructure UI is. Click on that link real quick. All right, my guess is that this is a paid thing. And Instructure is the... Um, It is the company that owns Canvas. So if you like it, get into the Canvas community and tell Instructure to build it in uh, to Canvas itself. Has anyone else um, in the participants uh, heard of Instructure UI? Or, yeah. You have thoughts on that? All right, if not, I'm afraid I don't have an answer either, so we're just going to move on to the next one. I've had many students complain that even in Canvas, every instructor sets up the course differently, and this creates confusion and frustration for them. Suggestions on best practices. Um, that's it exactly. Use those uh, Canvas templates. Keep it simple. Don't be too fancy in Canvas. Um, and encourage your instructors. The nice thing, I, again, it's a, a two-sided coin. The nice side of the coin is um, Canvas doesn't let you do very much with it. The opposite side of that is Canvas doesn't let me do anything. So I can't add too many images and overcomplicate the format of Canvas versus I wish I could add some images and make the format look a little bit nicer. There's this. Uh, what are they called? Struggle that we have, right? Um, really good point here. It's fine. I talk about this down at the very bottom. Um, any of the navigation tabs on the right hand side that you're not using, get rid of them. Um, turn off files because the file system in Canvas is really complicated. It's complicated for us to organize ourselves, and it's complicated for the students to find those files. Instead, add a file into a link on a page where you have context on, like on this file, 
click link to get to the homework for this week or whatever, uh, whatever the file is that you're sharing. That context really helps our students understand what it is they're looking for. Um, and if you think about at least my file naming system, I'm getting better at it, but it's still so hard for me to figure out um, how to be consistent about it from time to time. Um, great front page. Um, you can guide the students on where to go by having prerequisites, right? So in this way, you're taking away their ability to sort of jump ahead or to skip stuff. And they've got to click through every single one. For some students, that feels really constrained. But it's also a really good way for you as an instructor to make sure that they all at least click on and open up and click on that mark is done page, right? So prerequisites is another one and um, work is done. Yes, Molly, we keep this activity sheet on and attached um, to the um, Interactive Teaching Lab course, uh, Canvas course. And as soon as the course is over, we will put it up there. Um, some instructors will manually organize the modules. So, you know, you can click on that little grabby thing on the, on the one side of them and say, all right, we're done with this module, so I'm going to move it to the very bottom of the page. And then the next one is at the top of the page. And that way, when the students click on modules or when they go to your home page, at the very top of that home page, if you're using modules as your home page, um, what's coming up next week will be at the very top. And what we talked about last week will be at the very bottom. Um, they can get to that as well. The grabby thing, yes. There, there's a name for that, and I don't know what it is. UI person, what is that grabby thing? What do we call that? The dragger? I don't know. Again, uh, the docs and slides for context and learning things. This is a big one that I think I would I would not. Right, Tanya. Some people really dislike that. That's very offsetting because we know what the order looks like. But if it gets moved around, that'd be a problem. Um, and again, so be careful if you're doing that. And I forget stuff, so I would forget to move things around. Um, and that would drive people crazy. Thoughts on using underlines? Like sometimes um, we we have always in the past used underlines to um, emphasize things, right? But in internet parlance, the underline now is sort of uh, common for signifying that this is a link. And if we use that, I got a little example here. See. I used a nice little blue blue icon, uh, blue text here, and I underlined it to emphasize it, right? And what happens, I want to click on it and go to that link, but I can't because it's just an underline and it drives me nuts. All right, moving on. Uh, whoever had this question, are there other ideas that you have or questions uh, that we have not talked about? simplifying the user design. I don't know what the grabby thing is called. We just call it a little finger pointer. But um, I will say that um, one of the other sort of um, adages in user experience is that remember that most people are on someone else's site and not your own. So we have this instinct or desire to like create something really, you know, um, specific and unique um, and then remembering that really most of your students are not on your page they are on other pages most of the time like the, the time they're on your canvas course and your page is, is a small percentage of the amount of time they're on the internet so when there are other platform conventions that are being used elsewhere it's really best just to follow those conventions yeah because Familiarity, right? We have this sort of literacy language of, right? We know that an underlined thing is a link. We know that, um, well, there are other things, the pointer, the, the URLs, et cetera. Um, and your page is special. So don't make your page too special because then it gets harder to, to navigate. All right. And Mike's got a five minute screencast. Um, excellent. If you do have something unique, 
explain it to your students. Um, and a, a screencast is a really great way to, to kill a couple of these birds. Terrible metaphor, I apologize. I'll cover a couple of these things. One, it shows your personality. Two, it explains the logic and the way that you think, which your students will read between the lines that you speak and say, oh, if he's designing a web page in this way, there are a bunch of other assumptions that I can make about this person needs to have things their uh, non-standard way, right? So this is information that they want, that they need to figure out in order to be successful in your class. My understanding uh, is that it, that screencast would be very specific to your course, to that specific course. Um, and you can use tools like uh, Kaltura, QuickTime on the Mac makes a very easy uh, screencasts with audio narrative, um, uh, Screencastifier, and there's a bunch of other tools online that you can use. Very good. All right. Pros and cons of using modules. Oh, wait, we talked about that. Good. And maximum number of words. We talked about that as well. Wow. Are there any other new ones that came up here? We got through this page, this uh, activity sheet faster than I anticipated. So I'm going to encourage someone to fill in some blanks here or to add some more. Oh, there are more. I just didn't see them. All right, great. What are the educational plugins or extras that people suggest? OK, this is a really good topic. And again, it builds on the idea that we were just talking about, of keeping it simple, right? The, and we recognize that there are discipline-specific tools that your students might need to learn in order to have authentic experiences in your discipline, to learn your discipline and the practices of your discipline. I'm going to set those aside and say, if you need to use those, use those, right? But let's talk about Padlet. Padlet is a fantastic, simple tool. It's been used in K-12 for probably a dozen years. Aaron Rosen in here today? You can probably tell me. No. Um, and it's been vetted there, and it's considered safe and simple and educationally rich. However, it's one more thing for your students to learn. And it's not vetted and supported at UW-Madison, so we, we won't encourage its use. It's one more thing. And if that's the one more thing that's in your class, and then somebody in another one of your students' classes uses a different one more thing, and then somebody in the third class uses a different one more thing, it can get very complicated. Think about our video conferencing here on campus right now. We've got Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, which we're using right now. We've got Zoom. We've got WebEx. Uh, we've got Google Meet. Um, what am I missing? Google, uh, Microsoft Teams. So think about what your student experience or what your experience is like navigating between those five things. Each one is a little bit different. The uh, Zoom is very capable, but it has lots and lots of different um, settings that you need to figure out. And they're very different from the settings in Blackboard or Collaborate Ultra. So there are educational plugins and extras that people can use, and some of them are really great. Padlet is fantastic, in my opinion, though not supported. H5P is also a fantastic um, tool for creating interactive design. And especially, it's simple enough that you can have your students create those in order to illustrate um, their understanding of a concept, a great uh, form of multiple means of expression for universal design for learning. However, it's only supported if you use it in a uh, press books. Uh, so if you have your students create a textbook, for example, and you want them to have interactive activities in there, then you can use H5P. But it's kind of, you know, it is one other tool that they have to learn so don't make it a one-off if you go down that route. Make it a part of your parlance or, or, or the logic of your class so that they're not just learning it for a, a one-off, um, but it becomes part of uh, how they understand the concepts. All right, and that's my thought on the interactive assignments. I know that the writing across the curriculum is working on 
um, some information for more interactive assignments. We've got some good um, interactive is, is a, a type of active learning that is where the richest learning happens. Um, so in addition to interactive being like, I press this button and this thing happens, um, in active learning, interactive means I say something and I interact with you and you give me some feedback on that. And maybe together through that feedback and response, we are able to create this other thing. It's fantastic learning. Um, it's better than anything you can program via digital interaction, right? Because you don't have the budget to come up with every option that your students can come up with. But other students can respond to them in a very specialized way um, on the fly. So use your students for interactive learning. All right. Are there sample well-designed pages for other instructors that we can tour? Yes. Oh my gosh. Let me just uh, do a, a quick share. Let's see. Let's talk about the um, Canvas Commons. If you're not familiar with Canvas Commons, let me put a activity sheet link for it. Oh, I have I have information on Canvas Commons. There it is. So this little red thing on, on the lower right hand corner, or lower left hand corner of your Canvas course, right above help, there's a thing that says Canvas Commons. Or Commons. And in Commons, we have thousands of courses and pages um, and quizzes and all sorts of um, elements in Canvas that Canvas users across the world have contributed and said, I did this cool thing. I want to share it out. And you can go in and you can preview them and you can use them. Just as with templates, if you find one that you like, and you want to import it or download it, do that in your Canvas sandbox. Do not do that in your regular course, because if you do it in your regular course, all of a sudden, all of these other things in somebody else's course will come in, and it's kind of like throwing somebody else's closet into your closet and trying to figure out then, where's my favorite blazer? I don't have any blazers. Um, so use that sandbox course, but there are some great things in Canvas Commons, and you can filter it by K-12, you can filter it by your course, you can filter it by um, things from UW-Madison, you can filter it by all kinds of different um, filters that they have for that. So lots of good examples, um, the best in, the best that's uh, been out there and shared. Uh, YouTube's another great spot for uh, well-designed courses. Very good. Anyone have other thoughts on that? I'm going to uh, see if I can catch up on the chat real quick here. All right, Emily, um, it will require that you are logged in. Um, so log into your Canvas course first, for example. Um, and then you can zip over to that. Yeah, uh, Tanya, there are thousands and thousands of examples, and that's where using the filter is really important um, because it can be overwhelming. People produce a lot of stuff, and people produce a lot of really bad stuff, and they pass it off and share it as good stuff. So. Um, it requires some critical thinking to figure that out. All right, we're moving on to the next one. What are the pros and cons of using cross platforms other than Canvas? Uh, well, Canvas is the only learning management system that is supported at UW Madison. So, 
use Canvas. Um, and again, for all those reasons, your students are familiar with it from other courses that they're taking. Um, it's simple. It's been vetted by lawyers and privacy folks here on uh, UW-Madison. Um, so there's lots of reasons to use Canvas um, under the pros. The cons, well, there are cons, of course, as well. Since there aren't a lot of other choices, we encourage you to use Canvas. All right, Zoom is a question, and I can give you uh, what I know about Zoom. Zoom is a campus-supported tool. However, it is not, at this point, a Learn at UW Madison-supported tool. So what that means is that Zoom is turned on on campus specifically to support administrative uh, meetings and things like that. It was not turned on specifically to support teaching and learning. Um, currently, the teaching and learning tool of choice that is integrated into Canvas is Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, which is what we're using right now. Now, if you've used Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, you might notice that there are also some issues with Blackboard Collaborate Ultra that Zoom handles better. This semester, um, there is a group on campus that is looking to do that integration um, between Zoom and Canvas. Next semester, that might be an option that is turned on, um, but stay tuned on that. That's the information that I have on using Zoom. Um, and then our final question that we have in the last two minutes here um, is, are, as you survey students, would it be a good idea to ask them about the online logistics of the course? Um, not knowing exactly what that means by the online logistics, yes, you should survey the students. Do it a lot more than you usually do. If you think about remote learning especially, and when we come back after Thanksgiving, we're all going to be remote. Um, so our, we aren't going to get the feedback, uh, that sort of informal feedback, from our students' faces the way that, in a remote situation, the way that we do in a face-to-face -face situation. So we have to ask them. Ask them also to participate more than they normally would in a face-to-face -face course, and to give you more feedback because, and be open and honest with them about this, it's harder for us to keep track of them and to know how are they doing? Is everything working? Are there things that I'm doing as an instructor that are not working for you that I could do better? Keep those avenues of communication open um, so that your students come to trust you and see that you care about them because that's important. Yes, ask them about the logistics um, for online. Recognize that some students are going to be sharing a computer with younger siblings who have to use it at certain times of the day. Um, the internet might go out, so they might not want to show their face on camera. They might have another desk with their uh, kids behind them. Um, things can be ha chaotic in this time. And again, I want to point to that uh, trauma-based, trauma-informed pedagogy that's happening later on today. Um, can you share that link in the chat again? Things are messy right now, and the lines of communication between instructors and students, and students and students, need to be open and they need to be clear. And you've got to ask them, encourage them. It's too easy to just kind of fade away and hope that it all goes away as I kind of crumble up in my closet um, away from everybody. And when I do that, I stop engaging in the class. And when I stop engaging in the class, I don't do as well, and the learning's not as rich. So help your students, and help your students help each other. It's 2 o'clock. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. This activity sheet, again, will stay here. Um, keep this link. Keep it open as one of your 50 tabs if you're a any tab user. Um, and refer back to it. Add more ideas that you come up with it. Come to the next week's uh, Active Teaching Lab and ask more questions there as well. We're happy to continue to revisit these things. And thank you all. Thank you, Maria, for jumping in and helping out today with the, the UX stuff that I am not familiar with. And again, thanks to uh, the moderators, Sid uh, and Karen, for helping out in the 
um, in the chat. And thank you all participants for jumping in with chat questions and ideas in the activity sheet. Have a great afternoon. If you're in my Delta course, um, come back at 205 today because I'm going to try to convince you that we should all go to this uh, trauma-informed pedagogy session this afternoon at 2.30. And so I'd like to get our